Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. This is the fifth lecture of this level two course presented by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Abdullah Stienkam, and I'll be taking you through the lecture this, um, this morning. Uh, again, this week, I'm flying solo. The format of this week's lecture will be as follows. I will kick off with last week's revision questions. Then I'll cover laws 34, 37, 40 and 41. We will then go through two revision questions and then I will open the floor for Q&A. So the first revision question we tackled last week the final ball of the over, a clear edge by the strike of the keeper. So initially, no appeal by the fielding side. You then, as the bowlers in our umpire, calls over. And after calling over, now there's an appeal by the cover fielder. So what happens next? Lord tell us that an appeal is still valid as long as it's made before the bowler begins his or her run-up, or if there's no run-up, um, before his or her um, bowling action, and before time has been called. Also, the call of over does not invalidate an appeal as long as it's made before the next over starts, before the bowler takes his or her first step, and also time should not have been called. So now we know what the law tells us. So in our question, yes, you've called over, and now there's an appeal. We've just now saw in the law that even the call of over, that appeal is still valid as long as it's done before the bowler takes his or her first step. So the, we now know the appeal is still valid. So now if you as the bowler is in umpire, believes that the batter has edged the ball and the catch is cleanly taken, give the striker out a uh, court. And the non-striker, seeing that this is the last ball of the over, so the non-striker will now face the first ball of the next over. Eighty percent of all appeals on any given day at any level is for LBW. So it's very important that you do know how to handle or do you do know the LBW law. So the question is, what criteria do you take into account when there is an LBW appeal? Ball should not be a noble. It needs to pitch in line. It needs to pitch between wicket and wicket or on the off side of the wicket. If the ball pitches on the leg side, can never be out oh, LBW. Oh, the law is clear. Um, can I ask everyone to please mm. mute their microphones? Thank you so much. Okay, so Hello. if the ball, pitch, Hello, yeah, the ball needs to pitch in one line, one. Uh, can, I ask, can I ask everyone to please mute their microphones? Thank you so much. The ball needs to either pitch in line, pitches in line between wicket and wicket, or on the offside of the wicket. The ball should not have touched the bat first. If it touches the bat first, can never be out, be out LBW. If it touches the pad first and then the bat, then you can consider the LBW appeal. When considering an LBW appeal, the striker needs to can intercept the ball with any part of the striker's person. So it do, uh, doesn't have to be the the leg; can be any part of the body. Point of impact needs to be between wicket and wicket. There's one exception, unless the striker 
made no genuine attempt to play at the ball. If that is the case, then you can consider if the strike is outside of stump, you can consider the LBW appeal. But unless the striker did not attempt to play the ball, the impact needs to be between wicket and wicket. And lastly, the ball would have gone on to hit the wicket. So these six bullet points, uh, when there's an LBW appeal, it goes quickly through your mind. It goes like a split second, a second, sometimes two seconds. You consider all these six. six. If you tick all the boxes, you can then give the striker out LBW. Last of the revision questions last week. Off spinner delivers the ball from over the wicket to a left-handed batter. So now the striker changes the C stance to that of a right-handed batter. The striker now plays a sweet seat. The ball pitches outside the off stump of the now right-handed batter. The striker misses the ball, hits the striker on the back pad uh, in front of middle stump. There's a huge appeal. What is your decision? We know that the law tells us when it comes to the LBW law, um, the wide law do differ, but when it comes to the LBW law, what you need to take into account is the offside of the striker shall be determined by the striker's stance as soon as that ball comes into play. As soon as that, the bowler gives his uh, first step, now you judge, is this a left hand or a right hand better? And then that becomes the, the offside of the striker. So in this example, when that bowler took uh, his or her first step, the striker was a left-handed batter. And when the ball pitch, pitches, it pitched outside the leg stump of the left-handed batter. And because of that, ball pitch outside leg, that's why this appeal needs to be given not out. The first uh, few laws, the first three laws that I'm covering today are dismissal laws. There are nine dismissal laws, and they are bold, caught, hit the ball twice, hit wicket, LBW, obstructing the field, run out, stumped, and timed out. So nine dismissal laws. Of the nine dismissal laws, there are five of those dismissals that get credited to the bowler. The bowler if the bowler takes a uh, bowls the striker, that uh, wicket will go against the bowler's name. Similarly, if the striker's out court, LBW, hit wicket, and stumped, those five modes of dismissals will be credited to the bowler. So that's five. So the other four will not get credited to the bowler. And we're going to cover three of them in today's lecture. These three does not get credited to the bowler. The first of them is hit the ball twice. Let's look at a video. Hit the ball twice. Hit the ball twice and you're out. Unless, of course, you're defending your wicket or it was accidental, in which case you're still in. The striker is out hit the ball twice if, while the ball is in play, it strikes any part of his person or is struck by his bat and, before the ball has been touched by a fielder, he willfully strikes it again with his bat or person. The key word here is willfully. But if this had happened instead, the batsman would remain in. In other words, inadvertent double strikes don't count. The batsman is allowed to hit the ball a second time in order to guard his wicket. He can use his bat or almost any part of his body. He cannot, however, use a hand that's not holding the bat. 
the only time you can't use your bat to hit the ball twice to defend your wicket is when it would prevent a catch. The batsman can also hit the ball a second time in order to return it to a fielder, as long as the fielder has given him permission to do so. If you'd like to swat up on this a bit more, simply turn to Law 34 in the Blue Book, where you'll find all the nitty-gritty detail you need. So it can, when it comes to hit the ball twice, as the narrator said, it needs to be woeful. If it's accidental, not out hit the ball twice. And we've also heard that the law actually allows you to legally hit the ball a second time. When, you, when are you allowed to legally hit the ball a second time? Or even a third time or fourth time? Only to protect your wicket. That's the only time that you are actually allowed to willfully or legally hit the ball a second time. So if the ball rolls towards the striker's wicket, the striker is allowed to hit the ball a second or a third time. And then there's also a but here. Uh, unless, uh, even if it goes, uh, your striker wants to protect uh, um, his or her wicket, uh, but if the striker prevents a catch from being taken, the striker can be given out, obstructing the field. Uh, but legally, the ball rolls against the two towards the wicket. Striker is allowed to eat it a second time or a third time, only to protect the wicket. So now the strikers now the ball is towards the stri the, the wicket. The striker, uh, we now have just heard that the striker is allowed to protect um, his or wicket and he's allowed to eat the ball. Now the striker see the ball. But the striker hit the ball so hard, let's say it goes towards the, the um, square leg boundary. Is the striker allowed to run? What does the law say? No, the striker is not allowed to run after legally hitting the ball a second time. So no runs allowed. So what do you do as, a, as an umpire? If the striker now legally hits the ball a second time, you will, if the striker hits it so hard and it goes actually to the boundary, as soon as the ball goes over the boundary, you will call and signal dead ball. Or if the striker hits it, let's say, to, towards the square leg boundary and they start running, you will allow the, stri the, the, the batters to take the run upon the completion of the first run. As soon as they completed the first run, you need to call and signal dead ball. So we've now heard call and signal dead ball. If they do run and they complete the signal, that run will be disallowed. Or if they hit it so hard and it goes towards the boundary, that boundary will be disallowed. You will return the batters to their original end. Once they've completed the, the first uh, run, you'll call and signal dead ball. What you'll then do is you'll, you will then tell the batters, please go back to the original end. Even if one of the batters are run out on a, um, before completing the first run, you will tell the not out batter to please go back to his uh, original inn. If there was a no ball, that no ball will stand. So any five penalty run will be applicable. There's one exception, a helmet's belonging to the fielding side. If the ball should go against the helmet of the fielding side that was placed behind the keeper, that's the only five penalty runs in this particular law that will not be applicable. And as I said earlier, Bowler does not get credit for this mode of dismissal. The next mode of dismissal where a bowler does not get credit, that is obstructing the field. Let's look at a video. Obstructing the field. 
A batsman is out obstructing the field if he or she willfully attempts to obstruct or distract the fielding side by word or action. Like this, for example. Thank you, Tommy. In particular, it is considered to be obstruction if, while the ball is in play and after the striker has played the ball, either batsman willfully strikes the ball with a hand not holding the bat or any other part of his or her person or with the bat. The exception to this is when the batsman is attempting to defend his or her wicket. The batsman may do this with the bat or any part of his or her person, except with a hand not holding the bat. If the batsman uses such a hand, he or she will be out obstructing the field. The handle the ball law no longer exists, with such incidents now covered by obstructing the field. The obstruction has to be willful. Accidental obstruction or obstruction caused by trying to avoid injury does not count and the decision on that is down to the umpire. It's worth noting that if a catch is obstructed, it is the striker who is out, even if it was the non-striker who caused the obstruction. Mind you, it's not always an easy decision. Here, the batsman deliberately crosses out of the legal running area in order to attempt to obstruct a throw. There is no other reason why the batsman should be running across the pitch. What looked an accident was, in fact, an illegal incident. To avoid any possible confusion, read Law 37 in black and white in the blue book. So the important thing to take into account when judging and obstructing the, obstructing the field appeal, it needs to be willful. If accidental, according to you, give uh, the better uh, not out. You can consult, it's good practice, just to call and signal Deadpool, go to your colleague, consult, get another opinion, and, and if the two of you then agree that the either of the batters willfully obstructed, you can then give the batter out. If it was accidental, not out. So now in obstructing the field, this missile took place. Let's see how the Lord tell us in terms of runs scored. So if either of the batters are dismissed obstructing the field, firstly, unless the obstruction or distraction prevents the striker being out caught, any runs completed by the batters shall be scored, including any one run penalty for no ball or a wide, or and any award of five penalty runs to either side shall also be scored. We've just heard that if the obstruction prevents the striker from being out caught, then no runs to be scored, except penalties shall, to either side shall stand. And again, another example of where the bowler does not get credit for this particular mode of dismissal. Law 40, handles time out. When will a better be time out? Law tell us that the incoming batter needs to be, or unless time has been called, needs to be ready to receive the next ball or for the other batter to receive the next ball within three minutes of the dismissal or if a batter retires. Important thing here is needs to be there within three minutes. If not, the incoming batter on appeal will be given our time out. But importantly, with this law, before bef uh, before um, answering the appeal, find out why the batter is late. Maybe there is a a good reason why the 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 batter is is late. First, find out 
and if the batter is uh, late because the batter was still um, um, smoking a cigarette at the side of the field on appeal, you can then give the batter out. And again, this is another exam example of where the bowler does not get credit for this type of dismissal. The last law that I'm covering for today is fair and unfair play. So under the laws of cricket, the laws cover 16 instances of unfair play and how to deal with these instances. We will, in this lecture, only cover two of them. So what does this law do? Again, as I said, it's 16 instances. Examples of these are, um, let's say, bat, uh, batters wasting time, fielders wasting time, fielders damaging um, the the pits, fielding side trying to change the condition of of the match ball. These are just examples of unfair unfair play. So the law covers covers these examples. There are 16 of them, and it tells you exactly how to deal with these situations if they happen on the field of play. So in this lecture, we will only cover two of them. The first one is when there is a deliberate distraction, deception or obstruction of the batter after the ball was deli delivered. There's also a, uh, a section under here that if there's a deliberate distraction before the ball was delivered, what we're covering in this lecture is this distraction, deception, or obstruction happened or happens after the ball was delivered. Let's see what the law tells us. So if any fielder and the important word is here, willfully. If accidentally, not out, but if any fielder willfully attempt, it can be by either word or action to either distract, obstruct, or deceive either of the batters after the striker has received the ball. So again, importantly here is it needs to be a willful attempt by any of the field uh, and it can be by word or action and that willful attempt the field that try to distract obstruct or deceive either of the batters if that happens what do you do and again good umpiring technique call and signal dead ball get the ball go to your colleague discuss what both of you have seen. And if you are in consensus that the fielder willfully attempted by word or action to distract, obstruct, or deceive either of the batters, you will do the following. Call and signal dead ball. If this happens, neither batter shall be dismissed from this particular delivery. You will award five penalty runs to the batting side. This ball to not count as one for the over. Uh, can I please ask uh, you to mute your mics? Thank you so much. Any runs completed before the offense shall be scored, together with any penalty runs. Also, the run in progress whether the batters crossed or not, shall also be scored. The batters at the wicket, they will decide who faces the next delivery. You will inform captain of the fielding side, captain of the batting side, the batters, and this, report, uh, this incident shall be reported to the governing body of cricket for that particular competition. So you can see this fairly stiff penalty if both umpires agree that there was a willful attempt 
by the fielding side, and it can be by word or action to eat to the strike, struck or deceive either of the batters. You can just to summarize again. Soon as it happens, call and signal dead ball. Neither batter shall be dismissed from this delivery. Five penalty runs to go to the batting side. The ball also not to count as one for the over. Any runs completed before the offense to be scored. If there was any penalties, then, uh, like a no ball or white, that will also count. Also, the run that was in progress. And yeah, and this is the only place in the law that where it actually says, e even though if the batters cross or not, it's irrelevant whether they cross. As soon if they attempted the run, that run um, will also be scored. Again, also the only place, the only place in the law where batters at the wicket to decide who faces the next delivery. So you can see fairly stiff penalty if there was a willful or deliberate attempt by any of the fielders. The protected area. There is an area on the pitch and it's a rectangle area that we as umpires need to protect. It's an important job of, of the umpires to make sure that we protect uh, this particular area. Uh, in the next slide, there is a diagram that will clearly show where this area is. But according to, to the law, uh, this area is, is a rectangle bounded at each end by imaginary lines parallel to the popping crease and five feet or 1.52 meters in front of the popping crease. And on the side and on each side of the imaginary line joining the centers of the middle stump, each parallel to it and one foot or 30.48 centimeters from it. The, uh, um, the next slide will illustrate this clearly. So this is our pitch. So you'll see on the left on the left hand side, from the back edge of the popping crease, you'll take your tape measurement and you will, uh, you, will, you, will you will mark 1.52 meters from it or five feet. You'll do a similar uh, measurement from uh, on the other side from the back edge of the popping crease. 1.52 meters and he'll, there should be a mark. On the left hand side again, from the middle stump to the left of the middle stump, you'll take one foot or 3.48 centimeters from the middle stump and you'll make a mark. You'll similarly do, do to the right hand side, you'll take a measurement and 30.48 centimeters to the right of the middle stump and you'll make a mark. And the distance between the one mark and the other mark should be two feet. You do exactly the same on the other side. And if you draw dotted lines from the one end to the other end, like they did in this picture, there will be an area in like here in red, and that area is called the protected area. So before the game starts, important uh, duty um, of the umpires, you need to check that these markings are on the pitch. If not, you need to find the groundsman so that they can make these markings because these markings will help you to clearly see where the protected area is. Again, uh, you won't find these dotted lines on uh, on the pitch, but um, you you but it will definitely help you by using these markings to see where the protected area is. So we as umpires need to protect this area. We need to make sure that the bowlers. Don't go in in this particular area without reasonable cause. Sorry, can Abdullah. Please. Yes, can I'm sorry. I can't see the picture. Sorry for the interruption. I can't see the picture. Okay, no, no, no problem. Let me 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unsay my screen and then I'm going to say again and hopefully that will solve the problem. Okay, Just give me a second. Thank you. Yes. So uh, uh -huh, we'll I'm saving oh. my. It's I'm sharing my screen again. Can you confirm that you are able to see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? We can't see it. We can't see it. Negative, sir. We can't see. Still not. Are you able to see my screen now? No. Negative, no. sir. It's no. black. OK, let me just give me a second. Let me just try again. I'm not sure why this gremlin is crept into this into my laptop now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you able to see my screen? Negative, sir. It's a uh, up to last year camp. We can see only your initials. OK, I apologize for the hold up. Just give me a second. Technology is failing us today. I'm not sure why. No problem. I'm just trying again to see uh, to see my screen. Please let me know. As soon as you can see my, see my screen. Are you able to see my screen now? Still Negative only the sir. initials. Like, just give me a second. I humbly apologize, everyone. Okay. Are you able to now see anything? There's anything to the stop? Naked, sir. Your initials only. And the previous slides, could you all see the previous slides? Yes, yes we saw only. Did it suddenly you just did it did you suddenly did you suddenly just turn black? Yes, black. we never saw the the pitch. Okay. Let, let me try one let me try one thing. Let me let me I'm gonna leave the meeting. Then I'm going to come back into the meeting and hopefully that will reactivate my uh, my settings. So just, okay, just give me a second. Let me just leave the meeting. Okay, I'm back in the meeting. Fingers crossed, everyone. See if this works now. Okay, please tell me you're able to see my screen. Oh, no, negative. Not. You just see only, only seeing my initials. Yes, sir. I am stumped. I don't know why you're only seeing my initials. I mean, initially it it, it was fine. I I I'm, I'm don't know why you're only seeing my initials. Um, is there any any technical uh, person uh, in the meeting that can maybe guide me here? Why am I? Why would it would suddenly? 
Um, so uh, my only my initials. Um, now yeah. we. I'm on, sorry. Only suggestion, Abdullah, that that you probably need to restart your computer. Many times restart of your computer helps in this this kind of issues. Okay. Do you? Uh, can you all stay in the meeting? Can you give me two three minutes while I restart my laptop? Is that okay with everyone? Yes, sure. Yes, sir. Great, sure. we'll do. Okay, guys. Okay, I'll be back in two, three minutes. <laughs>
Hello everyone, I'm back. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Please work. Please work. Yeah, we got it. I just need to go get the slides. Just give me a second. Find my slides now. Are you able to see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And also at the same time, if you want to recheck on your Wi-Fi, if that is the correct Wi-Fi that you got connected to, it also appears that sometimes the Wi-Fi also makes this such kind of challenges. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Uh, yippee, yippee. Okay. Yeah, we're seeing it okay. PowerPoint. Yeah. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you seeing my screen at the moment? Yes, sir. We're waiting for PowerPoint. Are you not, are you not seeing my screen? Are you, are you seeing yes, my screen? Yes, we're seeing it. You are now at um, slide 17. So are you seeing the protected yeah. area? Yes, sir. No. Go to slide 18. Hey, brother, go. Brother, go. OK, are, are, you, are you now able to see the protected area? Can you see the screen? There's a picture on it. It's now it's shown in red. Not a picture. Can you see it? No, sir. The protected. Yes, so we can see. Down. Down. There's yeah, it. See There's the beach map. The protected area beach map can be seen. Okay. Yes, sir. We can see it now. It can be seen. Okay. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much. So can everyone can just we... mute their mics? Then I will continue. Confirm. Thank you. Okay. Patients sometimes these yeah sometimes these gremlins do uh, uh, um, kick in from time to time but uh, it won't phase us. So just to recap this protected area and it's important it's important job of our uh, um, of the umpire in every game that we need to protect this area. And so before the game starts part of our duties is to make sure that the markings are on the pitch these markings will help you um, see where the protected area is you won't find these dotted lines uh, on the pitch when you when you get to the when you get to the game uh, but these the markings will guide you where this area uh, is and how do you make this markings? If I can start on the left, left hand side. So from, from the middle stump to the left, you'll take your tape measurement and from that middle stump, you'll take 30.48 centimeters or one foot. You'll do exactly the same marking to the right hand side, one foot to the right hand side or 30.48 centimeters to the right hand side and you'll make a mark. Or still on the left hand side, from the back edge of the popping crease, you'll make a mark 1.52 meters or five feet, similarly at the other end. And you'll do exactly the same at the other end. And if you now can um, just imagine drawing dotted lines from the one line to the other line, and now you get this protected area marked in, in red. So we need to protect that area. Free bowlers, fielders, not allowed to go into this protected area without reasonable course. And not just bowlers or fielders. Similarly, batters, the striker, also not allowed to go into this particular area. So now we know we need to protect this area. So now, first thing that we're going to cover is what happens if the bowler goes into this protected area. What do we do as umpires? So the law guides us, the law tells us that it is unfair for the bowler without reasonable cause to go into this 
particular area, whether the ball is delivered or not. So what does it mean by without an reasonable course? If the ball gets, let's say, straight down the pitch and the bowler needs to feel the ball, the bowler is then allowed to go in there because the bowler has to feel the ball. If, let's say, the ball gets hit by the striker up in the air um, and the bowler needs to go into that area to take the catch, no problem. There is a reason why the bowler needs to go into that area. So if there's a reason for the bowler to go into that area, no problem. Otherwise, it's, it's, the bowler please, I can't is see this not, slide. Uh, okay. okay. Are, are you the only one not, not seeing the slide? Is it's anyone on. seeing the slide? Okay. I'm seeing it now. Think all 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 all. The I apologize for yeah, I'm I'm not sure what it is. It could be could be the connection. Um I think one of the attendees said the Wi-Fi. It 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 could be could be the Wi-Fi. It uh, um I am based in Cape Town. It is raining in Cape Town uh this morning, uh, so maybe it could be the rain that is affecting uh, the Wi-Fi. I'm, I'm not too sure. So what we are covering now is when the bowler goes into the protected area. Firstly, the law tells us if there's a reasonable cause, bowler needs to go feel the ball or catch the ball, then no problem. The bowler can then go in there. But without the reasonable cause, the bowler is not allowed to go into the protected area. So what happens now? There's no reasonable cause. The bowler actually goes into the protected area. What do we do? The law tells us that you need to first caution the bowler. The bowler is now gone into the protected area without reasonable cause. So caution the bowler. You'll inform the other umpire what just happened. Also inform the fielding captain. This caution to apply throughout this particular innings. If it happens in the first innings, it will apply throughout the first innings. So the first time the bowler goes in there, you will caution you more. Also inform the batters. Now in the same innings, the bowler again goes into the protected area. And it doesn't matter from which end, it's because sometimes bowlers trying to be clever. They, um, you'll give them a caution from your end, and they'll go bowl from the other side. Doesn't matter which side the bowler goes in there. And in this instance, the bowler again. This is now the second time the bowler goes into the protected area without a reasonable cause. You will now inform the bowler that this is now your final warning. And again, this final warning to apply throughout this particular innings. If it's the first innings, it shall apply throughout the first innings. So what happens if the bowler goes a third time in that particular innings into the, the protected area without reasonable cause? You will now direct the captain of the fielding side to suspend the bowler immediately. Bowler will then be taken out of the attack. If there are still balls to be completed in the over, another bowler needs to complete the over. And this new bowler should not have bowled the previous over, nor is this bowler allowed to bowl the next over. You will then inform everyone. So just to summarize, before I go to what happens when the striker he goes into the protected area. So I'll summarize what the law say. I'll then also uh, give you um, a bit of practical tips how to handle this particular law. So to summarize what the laws tell us. Firstly, without a reasonable cause, if the bowler goes into the protected area, the law first, firstly tell, tell us, caution the bowler. So you tell the bowler, this is, your, this is a caution for you going into the protected area. You'll inform the bowler's captain as well as the batters. So in the same innings, the bowler goes again into the protected area. Doesn't matter from which end. 
you will now give the other bowler, bowler, this is now your final warning for running into the protected area. Now the bowler goes in there a third time in the same innings. Now you need to suspend or ask the captain of the fielding side, captain, you need to remove the bowler from the attack. And if there are still balls left in the over, well, that over needs to be completed by another, another bowler. You inform everyone and you report this to the governing body. I mentioned earlier that this is three times on the third time in a particular innings, only the third time they remove the bowler from the attack. So if it happens in the first innings, the second innings, this these warnings does not carry over. In the second innings, bowler actually starts on a clean slate. So this is only in the in in, in my example, if it happens in the first innings, firstly caution, secondly, uh, final warning. And only on the third time, now you remove the bowler from the attack. So this is uh, what the law tells us how to handle if the bowler runs into or goes into the protected area without a reasonable cause. Give you a few uh, practical uh, way how to handle how to handle this. Importantly, as an umpire, we 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 try to to work with the bowlers like similarly let's say the 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 bowler gets close to the front line to the uh, pop increase or close to bowling a no ball we usually whisper in the bowler's ear ears uh, bowler you're getting uh, you know your front foot is close to being over the line you know thinking a bit back you know we try to work with the bowler Similarly, with this, even though there's nothing in the law, the law just tell us if the bowler goes in the caution, secondly, final warning, thirdly, remove from the attack. But what I'm trying to say, there's nothing in the law that uh, that speaks about you need to speak to the bowler first, try to work with the bowler, but this is just um, how we handle this practically on the field of, of play. We try to work with the bowler, and importantly, we take the match situation into account. And I'll come later uh, what I mean by taking the match situation into, a, into account. Usually bowlers, let's say this is the first over of, of the test match. Day one, very first over. The bowler now, in his or follow through, puts a foot in the protected area. So what do you now do? According to the law, if the bowler goes in there, you need to first give a caution, secondly, uh, second warning or final warning, and then thirdly, remove. So first over of the game, let's say it's the second ball, the bowler puts his foot in the protected area. Are you now going to give the bowler a caution? And according to the law, as per the law, yes, you have. But what we do is we try to work with the bowlers. So what I'll do is in that instance, first over of the game, second ball of the game, see the bowler's uh, foot go in there. I will, as the bowler walks, walks past me, I will whisper in the bowler's ear, bowler, you're in the protected area. Usually the bowler will say, thank you, umpire. I will make sure that I go wider the, the next ball. So again, you, you match situation first over, try to work with the bowler. Let's say the second or third over, you see the bowler goes in there again. Now what I'll do is, I'll now have a bit of a sterner word. Let's say bowler, I spoke to you previously. I see you now again in the protected area. Bowler will usually say, sorry, Ampi, I'll go wider. Again, this is this, what I'm explaining now is, a practical way to and to handle this. Um, there's nothing wrong if you want to apply the law. If the bowler goes in there the first time, and you and you want to give the bowler a warning. Uh, if you want to apply the law, there's nothing wrong. You can apply the law, but try to work with the bowler. Try to take match situation into account. And in this instance, first hour of play, bowler goes in there first time. I'll have a word with him. Second time, I'll have a stern, uh, sterner uh, word with the bowler. 
third time. Now the bowler goes in there. Now I'll tell the bowler, bowler, I've now discussed this with you. This is now the third occasion. I'll now bring in the fielding captain. I say, captain, I spoke to the bowler. This is the third time that, I'm, that I spoke to the bowler about running in the protected area. And now if it happens again, now I can give the bowler his uh, first, uh, first game. This is a practical way how to handle bowler running into the protected area. You try to work with the bowler, so you you can either give you can either give one or or two. Let's say if we're going to call it friendly friendly warnings before uh, going into a formal uh, caution. So you try to work with the bowler. You get first time you speak, second time. You speak again, you can maybe the second time bring in his or her captain. And then only on the third time or the fourth time, now you go over into action. So when you do go into action, no one is surprised. Everyone is quite well aware that you spoke to the bowler. The captain is well aware that you spoke to the bowler. So if we do go um, bowler, this is a caution for running into the protected area. No one is surprised. Captain uh, also is not surprised. If you suddenly just go into caution mode, second ball of the game, you say, Captain, bowler, uh, first caution for running into protected area. You are going to cause a bit of friction um, in in the game. Again, nothing wrong. The law tells us if the bowler goes in there, you need to uh, apply the law. But I'm just giving you a bit of practical tips how to apply this law. First, try to work with to work with the bowler. And after trying to work the bowler, um, let's say first time you speak, second time uh, you speak, you bring in his uh, captain, and then maybe the third time or the fourth time, now you go into into action. I mentioned earlier where the match situation is important. Players, they are cunning. You need to uh, you need to watch them carefully. Sometimes the match situation dictates that you need to go into action uh, into action e immediate immediately sometimes what the the bowlers will do they've got spinners in the in in their side so now they try to roughen up the protected area to bring their spinners to bring the uh, spinners uh, into into the game so again, taking the match situation into account, if you do feel that the bowler, because they've got two or three spinners in, in their side and they're trying to roughen up the protected area, you can then uh, step in immediately. First thing that happens, bowler, see you going in the, uh, you in the protected area. Next time, I'm going to give you a, a warning. You'll be much more sterner um, if the match situation um, allow it. Other times you'll, we'll be much more stern if, if the pits are, are brittle and if the bowler goes in there, it's gonna, it is, um, he or she is going to um, cause damage to the pits. You, you, in those instances, you'll also be a much, much more stern than at, at other times. So the point I'm just trying to make is take the match situation into account. Try to work with the bowler. Try to work with the bowler. Keep everyone informed. Keep bowler informed. Keep captain informed. That's just a practical tip how to handle bowler running into the protected area. So what happens if the striker goes into the protected area? So remember that is the protected area. So we need to protect it from the bowlers, fielders, and also the striker. The law guides us here by, tell, by telling us that the striker do not stand so close to the protected area. And by standing so close to the protected area, the striker will go into that area every single ball. Example of this, if you can visualize this, Let's say the striker stands uh, stands just outside the protected area, if you can visualize this. And if the bowler bowls the ball and the striker plays forward, that forward movement will take the striker's front foot into the 
protected area. So the Lord tells us, the striker, not to stand so close to the protected area, because by, the, by standing so close, every time the striker now plays forward, that front foot is going to go into the protected area. The Lord tells us, striker, not to stand there. You can have a word with the striker, or whisper in the striker, see a striker, you are close to the protected area, I need you to come back. If the striker um, continues standing there after you're having a word, you can then apply this law, and you'll see now what, what exactly you need to apply. But good practical tip is, if you do see the striker standing there, work with the striker, whisper in the striker's ear, you close, come back. The law also allows the striker to make uh, a mark on, on the pitch. And again, this mark should not be so close to the protected area. So what happens if the striker contravenes the above? Again, as I said, work with the striker. If you do see a striker close, whisper in his or her ear, you close, come a bit back. But after speaking to the striker, striker continues standing there and goes into the protected area. Firstly, give the striker first and final warning. To apply throughout the innings. And this is a team warning. It's not a, a, a batter's warning for that particular uh, uh, batter. It's a team warning. That's why you need to inform the non-striker and also each incoming batter because it's a team warning. So you'll inform the captain of the fielding side and when possible, inform the captain of the batting side that you've given a first and final warning. So now that's when it happens the first time. So now after giving the first and final warning, it now happens again in that particular innings. And again, because it's a team warning, even if the opening batter did it and you gave a first and final warning, now the number uh, eight batsman uh, does it. If it's in that same innings, and remember, we've just heard that you need to, uh, whoever did it, if the opening batter did it, you need to uh, give the first and final warning to the opening batter. You need to inform the non-striker and each incoming incoming batter that the team is on the first and final warning for the striker going into the protected area. So whichever batter in that particular innings does it again, just allow all runs to the batting side. Return any not a better to his original in. If there was a wide or noble, it will always be applicable. Award five penalty runs to the fielding side. Award any other five penalty runs that are applicable except protective elements belonging to the fielding side. You'll reform everyone and report this to the governing body. So you can see this fairly strict penalty for if the striker goes in, in there, the striker is first and final, and then five penalty runs. If the bowler goes in there, a bowler gets actually three awnings, caution, first and final, and then only the third time remove the bowler from the attack. So this is the punishment that you give if the bowler goes in there and if the striker goes into the protected area. That is my lecture for today. I am now going to open the floor and we're going to do the revision questions. That's going to be interactive. So I'm going to ask the questions. I am then going to look at the hands that are raised. And then I'm going to, lay, um, I'm going to uh, once I mention your name, you can unmute yourself and give us the answer. Just give me a second. Let me just look at the names. So the first question. 50 over game. First range bowler is the left arm swing bowler. And this bowler was 
coarsened by your colleague in the bowler's first spell for running in the protected area. So you've given, so your colleague gave this bowler a first and final warning for running in the protected area. Now, the bowler, after getting a, a course in by your colleague, and bowlers usually do this, they'll switch sides. They'll now come bowling from your end. So now it's, the bowler comes from your end. So now the first question, and this is a three-pronged question. So the first one is, now the bowler gives your cap, his cap to you. Explain your accents, if any. That's the first part of this particular uh, question. And if I can, if you can raise your hands and just give me a second, I just need to. If you can raise your hands and give me, after the bowler's not given a cap, given his cap to you, will you say anything to, bow, to the bowler? Or won't you say anything to bowler? We'll just take the cap. We'll inform the bow the batter that this is a new bowler. Or will you say something? And remember, this bowler bowled uh, is already on the first course and for running into the protected area. Let's see if I can see any hands. Just give me a second. I don't see any hands. So the bowler gives his cap. Are you going to say anything or not? I do see a hand. S, can you unmute yourself and tell me, are you going to say anything to the bowler or not? OK, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Um, this is the second mistake going to the protected area. So me, from what I got from you, I can apply the law, but I don't want to cause friction. I will have certain words with him. Just telling you, listen, is your second warning. Please, I'm going to take action from my side. Uh, uh, S, okay, yeah, S, the, so where are we now is the bowler hasn't bowled the ball yet. So what happened, and your bowlers usually do this. The bowler gets get a course in from the one side. Nine out of ten times, they'll switch to the other side. So now the bowler hasn't bowled the ball yet. The bowler now comes to you telling you, umpire, I'm going to bowl from your side. I'm left arm uh, over the wicket, and the bowler gives uh, his cap to you. So when one, the bowler's not given his cap to you, are you going to say anything to the bowler? Remember, he hasn't bowled the ball yet. That is that is my question. Will okay. you say anything to the bowler? Will Let's you say anything to the bowler? Me, no. I will okay. just tell him. You you already you tried this. <laughs> yeah, I will have my way, so but I wanna cause friction. Okay, um, uh, Imran, I saw you and you speaking to the bowler. <laughs> yes, um Abdullah, I would I, I would when the bowler chains chains ends and he gives me his cap, I will alert the bowler that he is on a on a warning just to actually keep yeah. things sort of like standardized so that he knows that sort of like mm -hmm. um, you already contravened. Yeah, well, well, well done, Imran. That is exactly what you need to do. Uh, you, you remember, your partner has already spoken to him probably two, two times, three times already, because uh, I'm sure your partner didn't go immediately into action. So the bowler's already been spoken to probably two, three times. And then your partner went into action. So 
as the bowler gives his cap to you, I will remind that bowler, bowler, you already on a first on a caution for running into the protected area. So you'll be much stricter on this particular bowler compared to another bowler that's maybe doing it for the first time. This bowler is already from the other side, already got two, three friendly warnings, already uh, was given a caution. So now he's trying his luck from your side. So you will remind the bowler, as you alluded to, that he, the bowler, you bowler, is already on warning for running into the protected area. Just good, um, good umpire technique. Just mention it to his captain as well. Captain, I see your bowlers coming from, from this end. Just letting you know, he's already on a caution for running into the protected area. So the point is, yes, you will be much stricter on this particular bowler uh, um, because the bowler's already on a caution, already went through probably two, three friendly awnings. So well done, uh, Imran. Next question. So now you've, your bowler's given his cap to you. The bowler has now, um, has now taken the ball. And the very first ball, the bowler actually goes into the protected area. Very first ball. Explain your actions, if any. What are you going to do? Now, Imran just said, do you have a word with the bowler? Bowler, you're on a caution. You know, be careful. And the very next ball, the ball actually goes in there. What do you do? Will you do anything? Let me see if I can see any hands raised. Um, Amrut, I see your hands raised first. If you can unmute yourself. Good morning, sir. Morning. Uh, in this case, this is the second uh, instance of uh, yeah. uh, the baller contravening the law. So mm -hmm. I will, uh, as an umpire, I will... Uh, Caution again, the uh, mm -hmm. and inform my other colleague. Yeah. Uh, inform the uh, uh, captain of the fielding side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, again, uh, caution the baller that it's a final warning for you. Yeah. Yes, Amrit. Well done. That's exactly what I what I'll do. Uh, again, um, you will, as Amrit said, form the bowler. This is now your final warning. Form the fielding captain. Uh, batters, so everyone, your colleagues, everyone is well aware that this bowler is on his final course. And so now, this the same bowler in the same innings, fourth ball of his third over in this spell. There's now a huge albis out, but you are unsighted, and the reason you are unsighted is the bowler ran straight down the middle of the pitch that first and the second stride was straight down and obviously in the protected area you turn down the lbw appeal explain your actions if any let me see if any hands are raised uh, the first hand i see raised is uh, lux if you can unmute yourself yeah hi good morning so in this morning. case, after the warning has been given, I would huh? call. I would call what? the bowling captain and, and hello. Okay, so I would call the captain and ask the bowler to be removed because he's already been mm -hmm. cautioned and warned. Mm -hmm. And yep. um, I would ask him to be removed and have another uh, bowler complete the spell um, and who's not bowled the previous over as well. Mm. Uh, complete yep. the spell, and he, uh, this bowler cannot bowl for the entire innings. Well done, Lux. Textbook answer. That's exactly. You can just go through the answer. So the the first one, you'll just remind the bowler that he's already on the course and for running into the predicted area on the previous spell. Second one was you will then give the bowler his final warning, and then thirdly, you will ask the bowler to remove the captain to remove the bowler from the attack. Final question for today before I open the floor for Q&A. 50 over game, striker eats the ball, starts running, striker make good his ground at the bowler's end and now turns for the second. 
the short leg fielder then willfully obstruct the striker with his foot. The striker tries to run, short leg fielder puts out his foot, striker then trips over his foot. What happens next? Can I, I'm going into the third box to see if there's any hands raised. The only hand that I see, um, I see two hands raised, but I'm give preference to one that didn't answer yet. Uh, Mzoi, do you want to give this question a go? If you can unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Ah, loud and clear. Okay. Um, in this instance, I would award five penalty runs to the batting side. Mm hmm Is that the only thing you'll do? Oh, no. I want five penalty runs to the batting side, inform yeah. my colleague of what has happened, inform the captain of the fielding side of what has happened, and mm -hmm. as soon as practicable, I would inform the batting captain of what has happened. And then, since penalty runs are awarded, we would have to go through the reporting procedure, so I would inform the mm -hmm. executive of the offending side of what has happened, as well as the governing yeah. body responsible for the match. Mm -hmm. Together with my partner. Yeah. Yeah, the um, that's um, the, this question is usually um, about six to seven marks. I will give you three marks for your answer. There's quite a few things that have, that you need to do that you did not cover, Mzoi. Um Let me see if I, I'm going to uh, Amrut. If you can unmute yourself, what other steps do you need to follow as the umpire? Yeah, so uh, I first, first uh, call and signal dead ball. Yeah. Uh, and it is already evident that it is a willful obstruction. So I yeah. mm -hmm. required to discuss with the colleague. Uh, then uh, award five penalty runs to the batting side. Mm -hmm. uh, neither batter shall be dismissed from this delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, and also any runs completed before the off offense has occurred. And also... Uh, the run uh, during uh, when this op when the bat in this case the striker is actually turning for the second run, so that will yeah. also be counted. Yeah, uh, shall be uh, that together will be scored and inform the scorer. Mm -hmm. Then uh, either of the batters uh, can decide uh, who will face the next ball. Yes, Samrat. Well, well done. Now that is a textbook answer. Um, so I'm sorry, the, those are the, the yeah. The, so the steps that you you left out was that uh, you firstly need to call a dead ball. Neither better to dismiss from that delivery ball, not to count as one for the over, and any runs completed before the offense together with the run in progress. So in this instance. This happened on the second run, even though the, the second run was not completed. According to the law, there will be uh, seven runs in total. So five penalty runs and one for the completed run and one for the second run, even though it wasn't completed. But the law tells us that that run will count. So two runs plus the five, seven runs in total. And batters can decide who to face the next delivery. Thank you so much, everyone. These are the revision questions for today. I am now going to open the floor for q and A. I'm first going to go to the chat box. And after answering the questions in the chat box, I will then I will then go to the floor and take any questions from the floor. Go to the chat box. The uh, first question is from Ben. Ben asks, if a bowling side is awarded a penalty run, how are these runs allocated on the score sheet? Does it get added on the batting innings, even though they haven't batted yet? Or does the runs get missed from the batting side? So, Ben, 
on the, in the scorebook, there is a section for penalty runs. There's a section for wide. There's a section for uh, noble, and there's a separate section for uh, penalty runs. If any of these occur, let's say a noble, you'll go to that particular section. You'll add it to the um, to to the noble, and you also add it to the uh, the, the score. So when it comes to these these five penalty runs that allocated, there is a section in the scorebook that you do indicate that you do indicate um, that there's been five penalty runs awarded to the, the batting side. So to answer your your question about if the side hasn't batted yet and there's penalty runs, what happens? The scorers need to need to make a note that. Five penalty runs were also awarded to the batting side, even though they haven't batted yet. So when their inning starts, those five penalty runs will go on the scorebook in that particular section where you add uh, uh, the penalty runs. You put in there five penalty runs. It will then be added there as well as it will be added to the scorebook. So technically, even before the inning started, the batting side um, was on uh, five runs um, already. So they are. That is how they and the scorers handle that bin. Hmm? I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Okay. I will hmm. now go to the to the floor. If okay. anyone has a question, can you raise your hand and yeah. ask your question? I suppose this thread like this one. You know if he's stressing now. You see, I see there's a hand raised. Um, Mr. Solomons, the floor is yours. Um, good morning, you can unmute Abdullah. yourself and ask your question. Morning to you. Morning. I just have a question about fair and unfair play. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you can actually remember, there was an instance a few years ago um, in a match between South Africa and Pakistan, where the Pakistan batter actually hit the ball to the um, long of boundary. It was fielded. They ran through for the one run, and as they turned, the South African wicketkeeper pointed at the non-striker's end. And the better, the striker actually turns around and look at the non-striker, uh, unaware that the ball was actually going to his side, and he was run out. Uh, could have then been seen as deliberately distracting the the better or unfair play. Um, actually, with your permission, I actually got the clip, and if I can share the sc my screen, so you can just um, see the video clip um, to what I'm talking about. Yeah, you can play the clip, yes. Share your screen and then play the clip, and let's get, um, this is going to be interactive, so we're going to get everyone's um, opinion on this. Just. Um, let me know when you can see my screen. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Can you play the clip? And there, the keeper is pointing to the non striker, and the batsman turned around and he was run out. Wouldn't there have been? unfair play and the batters actually shouldn't be out, even out? Or how would you regard this, this situation? Okay, I'm going to open the floor. We've just we've just covered uh, what happened if there's uh, distra distraction, obstruction or deception by any of the fielders after the strikers received the delivery. In this case, the strikers received the delivery. So you saw the video, uh, Mzoi, can I can we get your input? OK, yeah, I saw the video um, and I was actually watching the game. So law 41.5.1 says it is unfair for any fielder willfully to attempt by word or action to distract, deceive or obstruct either batsman after the striker has received the ball. And so the key word there is willfully. Okay, and also attempt. We know that the law says it's up to the umpires to decide whether Quinton de Kock's actions were indeed 
an attempt to distract Fakas Aman. So in this case, the umpires saw that maybe not, there was no deliberate attempt to, to, to distract him. So that's why he was not given out. Um, that's why Fakas Aman was given out. Yes, I'm sorry. And that is exactly what happened. It is up to the umpires. They need to ascertain whether they feel there was willful distraction or deception or obstruction. In this case, they felt was, um, there was no willful deception or uh, by Quentin de Kock. Hence, Faka was given was given out. So if these things happen, get together with your colleague. If the two of you decide that it there was willful deception by the fielding side, you can apply the law. If not, like in this case, they felt it was not, hence they uh, Faka was Faka was run out. So just up to the two umpires after discussing this, you feel yes, apply the law. If no, the, the run out will stand. And Missouri, you're correct, umpires decided they felt it was uh, it was not willful. Uh, it wasn't willful deception. They were happy with it. That's why the run out counted. Did I answer your question, Mr. Solomon? Uh, thanks, guys. Understand. Thank you. Okay. Let me go to the chat box. See if there's any. Can you please remind me when the exam is and the exam fee? Um, the exam, there's two settings of the of the exam. One will be on a Saturday morning from nine till eleven, and that is going to be Saturday the thirteenth of of May, nine till eleven. That's the first setting of the exam. The second setting of the exam will be on Monday the fifteenth, and that will be in the evening. Um, I think it's from either six till eight or half past six till half past half past eight. So those are the timings. In terms of the exa exam fee, um, I'm not 100 percent sure of the exam fee. I'll get back to you uh, next week. Tom will be on the session next week, and Tom will go through the exam logistics um, uh, uh, next week. So. Um, so next week I'll we will I'll give you or Tom will give you the answer of exactly the cost for the exam. I'm going to the chat box. I see there's a question from my uh, yes. There is any second attempt, only one attempt. Um my yes, I don't understand your question. Can you unmute yourself and just elaborate what you mean by any second attempt or only one attempt? Oh, oh, for the exam, sorry. Uh, so my yes, you only get one attempt unless you get between 75 and 80%. 80% is the pass mark. If you do get between 75 and 80, there'll be an, another attempt, but anything below 75, you will have to re um, redo the course on another time. Yeah, Sandeep just put in the, the timings of the exam as well as the fees. Uh, thank you so much, Sandeep. If you can look in the chat box, you'll see the the um, the exam fees as well as the timings. Any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand. Let me go to the chat box to see if there's any further questions. I don't see any further questions in the chat box. I don't see any hands raised. There's no questions. Next week will be our final lecture before the exam. So next week will be what we call a revision lecture. 
Next week is very important. We will go through all the revision questions that we've covered over the past few over the past few uh, few lectures. We will also go through um, exam logistics. So if there's no further questions, I want to thank everyone for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, Tao, I see what what are those outside of Africa? I, I see your question is probably the the cost is if you're outside South Africa, 30 US dollars for anyone outside South Africa. If that is your question. And as Sandeep uh, correctly alluded to, exam logistics are explained in detail in uh, in the email. I don't see any hands. I don't see any further questions in the chat box. Thank you so much for joining me this morning or afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Dylan. Goodbye, all. everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye Thank everyone. you. Thank you. It's a privilege.